1 Corinthians, Chapter 11 Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible An Exposition, with Practical Observations, of The First Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians Chapter 11 In this chapter the Apostle blames and endeavors to rectify some great indecencies and manifest disorders in the Church of Corinth, as 1. The misconduct of their women, some of whom seem to have been inspired, in the public assembly, who lay by their veils, the common token of subjection to their husbands in that part of the world. This behavior he reprehends, requires them to keep veiled, asserts the superiority of the husband, yet so as to remind the husband that both were made for mutual help and comfort, verses 1 to 16. 2. He blames them for their discord and neglect and contempt of the poor, at the Lord's Supper, verses 17 to 22. 3. To rectify these scandalous disorders, he sets before them the nature and intentions of this holy institution, directs them how they should attend on it, and warns them of the danger of a conduct too indecent as theirs, and of all unworthy receiving, verses 23-34. First Corinthians 11 verses 1-16 Paul, having answered the cases put to him, proceeds in this chapter to the redress of grievances. The first verse of the chapter is put, by those who divided the epistle into chapters, as a preface to the rest of the epistle, but seems to have been a more proper close to the last, in which he had enforced the cautions he had given against the abuse of liberty, by his own example, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ, verse 1, fitly closes his argument, and the way of speaking in the next verse looks like a transition to another. But, whether it more properly belonged to this or the last chapter, it is plain from it that Paul not only preached such doctrine as they ought to believe, but led such a life as they ought to imitate. Be ye followers of me, that is, be imitators of me, live as you see me live. Note, ministers are likely to preach most to the purpose when they can press their hearers to follow their example. Yet would not Paul be followed blindly neither. He encourages neither implicit faith nor obedience. He would be followed himself no further than he followed Christ. Christ's pattern is a copy without a blot, so is no man's else. Note, we should follow no leader further than he follows Christ. Apostles should be left by us when they deviate from the example of their master. He passes next to reprehend and reform an indecency among them, of which the women were more especially guilty, concerning which observe. 1. How he prefaces it. He begins with a commendation of what was praiseworthy in them, verse 2 I praise you, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Many of them, it is probable, did this in the strictest sense of the expression, and he takes occasion thence to address the body of the church under this good character, and the body might, in the main, have continued to observe the ordinances and institutions of Christ, though in some things they deviated from, and corrupted, them. Note, when we reprove what is amiss in any, it is very prudent and fit to commend what is good in them, it will show that the reproof is not from ill will, and a humor of censuring and finding fault, and it will therefore procure the more regard to it. 2. How he lays the foundation for his reprehension by asserting the superiority of the man over the woman, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Christ, in his mediatorial character and glorified humanity, is at the head of mankind. He is not only first of the kind, but Lord and Sovereign. He has a name above every name, though in this high office and authority he has a superior, God being his head. And as God is the head of Christ, and Christ the head of the whole humankind, so the man is the head of the two sexes, not indeed with such dominion as Christ has over the kind or God has over the man Christ Jesus, but a superiority in headship he has, and the woman should be in subjection and not assume or usurp the man's place. This is the situation in which God has placed her, and for that reason she should have a mind suited to her rank, and not do anything that looks like an affectation of changing places. Something like this the women of the church of Corinth seem to have been guilty of, who were under inspiration, and prayed and prophesied even in their assemblies, verse 5. It is indeed an apostolical canon, that the women should keep silence in the churches, chapter 14 verse 34, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12 which some understand without limitation, as if a woman under inspiration also must keep silence, which seems very well to agree with the connection of the Apostles' Discourse, chapter 14. Others with a limitation, though a woman might not from her own abilities pretend to teach, or so much as question and debate anything in the church yet when under inspiration the case was altered, she had liberty to speak.
or, though she might not preach even by inspiration, because teaching is the business of a superior, yet she might pray or utter hymns by inspiration, even in the public assembly. She did not show any affectation of superiority over the man by such acts of public worship. It is plain the apostle does not in this place prohibit the thing, but reprehend the manner of doing it. And yet he might utterly disallow the thing and lay an unlimited restraint on the woman in another part of the epistle. These things are not contradictory. It is to his present purpose to reprehend the manner wherein the women prayed and prophesied in the church, without determining in this place whether they did well or ill in praying or prophesying. Note, the manner of doing a thing enters into the morality of it. We must not only be concerned to do good, but that the good we do be well done. 3. The thing he reprehends is the woman's praying or prophesying uncovered, or the man's doing either covered, verses 4 and 5. To understand this, it must be observed that it was a signification either of shame or subjection for persons to be veiled or covered in the eastern countries, contrary to the custom of ours, where the being bareheaded betokens subjection and being covered superiority and dominion. And this will help us the better to understand. For, the reasons on which he grounds his reprehension. 1. The man that prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonoreth his head, namely, Christ, the head of every man, verse 3, by appearing in a habit unsuitable to the rank in which God has placed him. Note, we should, even in our dress and habits, avoid everything that may dishonor Christ. The woman, on the other hand, who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, namely, the man, verse 3. She appears in the dress of her superior, and throws off the token of her subjection. She might, with equal decency, cut her hair short, or cut it close, which was the custom of the man in that age. This would be in a manner to declare that she was desirous of changing sexes, a manifest affectation of that superiority which God had conferred on the other sex. And this was probably the fault of these prophetesses in the church of Corinth. It was doing a thing which, in that age of the world, betokened superiority, and therefore a tacit claim of what did not belong to them but the other sex. Note, the sexes should not affect to change places. The order in which divine wisdom has placed persons and things is best and fittest, to endeavor to amend it is to destroy all order and introduce confusion. The woman should keep to the rank God has chosen for her and not dishonor her head, for this, in the result, is to dishonor God. If she was made out of the man and for the man and made to be the glory of the man, she should do nothing, especially in public, that looks like a wish of having this order inverted. 2. Another reason against this conduct is that the man is the image and glory of God, the representative of that glorious dominion and headship which God has over the world. It is the man who is set at the head of this lower creation, and therein he bears the resemblance of God. The woman, on the other hand, is the glory of the man, verse 7 she is his representative. Not but she has dominion over the inferior creatures, as she is a partaker of human nature, and so far is God's representative too but it is at second hand. She is the image of God, inasmuch as she is the image of the man, for the man was not made out of the woman, but the woman out of the man, verse 8. The man was first made, and made head of the creation here below, and therein the image of the divine dominion, and the woman was made out of the man, and shone with a reflection of his glory, being made superior to the other creatures here below, but in subjection to her husband, and deriving that honor from him out of whom she was made. 3. The woman was made for the man, to be his helpmeet, and not the man for the woman. She was naturally, therefore, made subject to him, because made for him, for his use, and help, and comfort. And she who was intended to be always in subjection to the man should do nothing, in Christian assemblies, that looks like an affectation of equality. 4. She ought to have power on her head, because of the angels. Power, that is, a veil, the token, not of her having the power or superiority, but being under the power of her husband, subjected to him, and inferior to the other sex. Rebecca, when she met Isaac, and was delivering herself into his possession, put on her veil, in token of her subjection, Genesis 24 verse 65. Thus would the apostle have the women appear in Christian assemblies, even though they spoke there by inspiration, because of the angels, that is, say some, because of the evil angels. The woman was first in the transgression, being deceived by the devil, 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, which increased her subjection to man, Genesis 3 verse 16. Now, believe evil angels will be sure to mix in all Christian assemblies, 
therefore should women wear the token of their shamefacedness and subjection, which in that age and country, was a veil. Others say, because of the good angels. Jews and Christians have had an opinion that these ministering spirits are many of them present in their assemblies. Their presence should restrain Christians from all indecencies in the worship of God. Note, we should learn from all to behave in the public assemblies of divine worship so as to express a reverence for God and a content and satisfaction with that rank in which he has placed us. 5. He thinks fit to guard his argument with a caution lest the inference be carried too far, verses 11 and 12 Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. They were made for one another. It is not good for him to be alone, Genesis 2 verse 18, and therefore was a woman made, and made for the man, and the man was intended to be a comfort, and help, and defense, to the woman, though not so directly and immediately made for her. They were made to be a mutual comfort and blessing, not one a slave and the other a tyrant. Both were to be one flesh, Genesis 2 verse 24, and this for the propagation of a race of mankind. They are reciprocal instruments of each other's production. As the woman was first formed out of the man, the man is ever since propagated by the woman, verse 12, all by the divine wisdom and power of the first cause so ordaining it. The authority and subjection should be no greater than are suitable to two in such near relation and close union to each other. Note, as it is the will of God that the woman know her place, so it is his will also that the man abuse not his power. 6. He enforces his argument from the natural covering provided for the woman, verses 13 to 15 Judge in yourselves consult your own reason, hearken to what nature suggests is it comely for a woman to pray to God uncovered? Should there not be a distinction kept up between the sexes in wearing their hair, since nature has made one? Is it not a distinction which nature has kept up among all civilized nations? The woman's hair is a natural covering, to wear it long is a glory to her, but for a man to have long hair, or cherish it, is a token of softness and effeminacy. Note, it should be our concern, especially in Christian and religious assemblies, to make no breach upon the rules of natural decency. 7. He sums up all by referring those who were contentious to the usages and customs of the churches, verse 16. Custom is in a great measure the rule of decency. And the common practice of the churches is what would have them govern themselves by. He does not silence the contentious by mere authority, but lets them know that they would appear to the world as very odd and singular in their humor if they would quarrel for a custom to which all the churches of Christ were at that time utter strangers, or against a custom in which they all concurred, and that upon the ground of natural decency. It was the common usage of the churches for women to appear in public assemblies, and join in public worship, veiled, and it was manifestly decent that they should do so. Those must be very contentious indeed who would quarrel with this or lay it aside. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 22 In this passage the apostle sharply rebukes them for much greater disorders than the former, in their partaking of the Lord's Supper, which was commonly done in the first ages, as the ancients tell us, with a love feast annexed, which gave occasion to the scandalous disorders which the apostle here reprehends, concerning which observe. 1. The manner in which he introduces his charge, now in this that I declare to you I praise you not, verse 17. I cannot commend, but must blame and condemn you. It is plain, from the beginning of the chapter, that he was willing and pleased to commend as far as he could. But such scandalous disorders, in so sacred an institution, as they were guilty of, called for a sharp reprehension. They quite turned the institution against itself. It was intended to make them better, to promote their spiritual interests, but it really made them worse. They came together, not for the better, but for the worse. Note, the ordinances of Christ, if they do not make us better, will be very apt to make us worse, if they do not do our souls good, they do us harm, if they do not melt and mend, they will harden. Corruptions will be confirmed in us, if the proper means do not work a cure of them. 2. He enters upon his charge against them in more particulars than one. 1. He tells them that, upon coming together, they fell into divisions, schism schismata. Instead of concurring unanimously in celebrating the ordinance, they fell a quarreling with one another. Note, there may be schism where there is no separation of communion. Persons may come together in the same church, and sit down at the same table of the Lord, and yet be schismatics. 
Uncharitable is alienation of affection, especially if it grows up to discord, and feuds, and contentions, constitute schism. Christians may separate from each other's communion, and yet be uncharitable one towards another, they may continue in the same communion, and yet be uncharitable. This latter is schism, rather than the former. The apostle had heard a report of the Corinthians' divisions, and he tells them he had too much reason to believe it. For, adds he, there must be heresies also, not only quarrels, but factions, and perhaps such corrupt opinions as strike at the foundation of Christianity, and all sound religion. Note, no marvel there should be breaches of Christian love in the churches, when such offenses will come as shall make shipwreck of faith and a good conscience. Such offenses must come. Note that men are necessitated to be guilty of them, but the event is certain, and God permits them, that those who are approved, such honest hearts as will bear the trial, may be set to view, and appear faithful by their constant adherence to the truths and ways of God, notwithstanding the temptations of seducers. Note, the wisdom of God can make the wickedness and errors of others a foil to the piety and integrity of the saints. 2. He charges them not only with discord and division, but with scandalous disorder, for in eating every one taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken, verse 21. Heathens used to drink plentifully at their feasts upon their sacrifices. Many of the wealthier Corinthians seem to have taken the same liberty at the Lord's table, or at least at their agape, or love feasts, that were annexed to the supper. They would not stay for one another, the rich despised the poor, and ate and drank up the provisions they themselves brought, before the poor were allowed to partake, and thus some wanted, while others had more than enough. This was profaning a sacred institution, and corrupting a divine ordinance, to the last degree. What was appointed to feed the soul was employed to feed their lusts and passions. What should have been a bond of mutual amity and affection was made an instrument of discord and disunion. The poor were deprived of the food prepared for them, and the rich turned a feast of charity into a debauch. This was scandalous irregularity. 3. The Apostle lays the blame of this conduct closely on them. 1. By telling them that their conduct perfectly destroyed the purpose and use of such an institution, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, verse 20. It was coming to the Lord's table, and not coming. They might as well have stayed away. Thus to eat the outward elements was not to eat Christ's body. Note, there is a careless and irregular eating of the Lord's Supper which is as none at all, it will turn to no account, but to increase guilt. Such an eating was that of the Corinthians, their practices were a direct contradiction to the purposes of this sacred institution. 2. Their conduct carried in it a contempt of God's house, or of the church, verse 22. If they had a mind to feast, they might do it at home in their own houses, but to come to the Lord's table, and cabal, and quarrel, and keep the poor from their share of the provision they're made for them as well as rich, was such an abuse of the ordinance, and such a contempt of the poorer members of the church more especially, as merited a very sharp rebuke. Such a behavior tended much to the shame and discouragement of the poor, whose souls were as dear to Christ, and cost him as much as those of the rich. Note, common meals may be managed after a common manner, but religious feasts should be attended religiously. Note, also, it is a heinous evil, and severely to be censured, for Christians to treat their fellow Christians with contempt and insolence, but especially at the Lord's table. This is doing what they can to pour contempt on divine ordinances and we should look carefully to it that nothing in our behavior at the Lord's table have the appearance of contemning so sacred an institution. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23-34 To rectify these gross corruptions and irregularities, the Apostle sets the sacred institution here to view. This should be the rule in the reformation of all abuses. 1. He tells us how he came by the knowledge of it. He was not among the Apostles at the first institution, but he had received from the Lord what he delivered to them, verse 23. He had the knowledge of this matter by revelation from Christ, and what he had received he communicated, without varying from the truth a tittle, without adding or diminishing. 2. He gives us a more particular account of the institution than we meet with elsewhere. We have here an account. 1. Of the author our Lord Jesus Christ. The King of the Church only has power to institute sacraments. 2. The time of the institution, it was the very night wherein he was betrayed, just as he was entering on his sufferings which are therein to be commemorated. 3. The institution itself. 
Our Savior took bread, and when he had given thanks, or blessed, as it is in Matthew 26 verse 26, he broke, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in like manner he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me, verses 24 and 25. Here observe. 1. The materials of this sacrament, both. 1. As to the visible signs, these are bread and the cup, the former of which is called bread many times over in this passage, even after what the papists call consecration. What is eaten is called bread, though it be at the same time said to be the body of the Lord, a plain argument that the apostle knew nothing of their monstrous and absurd doctrine of transubstantiation. The latter is as plainly a part of this institution as words can make it. St. Matthew tells us, Our Lord bade them all drink of it, chapter 26 verse 27, as if he would, by this expression, lay in a caveat against the papists depriving the laity of the cup. Bread and the cup are both made use of, because it is a holy feast. Nor is it here, or anywhere, made necessary, that any particular liquor should be in the cup. In one evangelist, indeed, it is plain that wine was the liquor used by our Savior, though it was, perhaps, mingled with water, according to the Jewish custom, vid Lightfoot on Matthew 26. But this by no means renders it unlawful to have a sacrament where persons cannot come at wine. In every place of Scripture in which we have an account of this part of the institution it is always expressed by a figure. The cup is put for what was in it, without once specifying what the liquor was, in the words of the institution. 2. The things signified by these outward signs, they are Christ's body and blood, his body broken, his blood shed, together with all the benefits which flow from his death and sacrifice, it is the New Testament in his blood. His blood is the seal and sanction of all the privileges of the new covenant, and worthy receivers take it as such, at this holy ordinance. They have the New Testament, and their own title to all the blessings of the new covenant, confirmed to them by his blood. 2. We have here the sacramental actions, the manner in which the materials of the sacrament are to be used. 1. Our Savior's actions, which are taking the bread and cup, giving thanks, breaking the bread, and giving about both the one and the other. 2. The actions of the communicants, which were to take the bread and eat, to take the cup and drink, and both in remembrance of Christ. But the external acts are not the whole nor the principal part of what is to be done at this holy ordinance, each of them has a significancy. Our Savior, having undertaken to make an offering of Himself to God, and procure, by His death, the remission of sins, with all other gospel benefits, for true believers, did, at the institution, deliver His body and blood, with all the benefits procured by His death, to His disciples, and continues to do the same every time the ordinance is administered to the true believers. This is here exhibited, or set forth, as the food of souls. And as food, though ever so wholesome or rich, will yield no nourishment without being eaten, here the communicants are to take and eat, or to receive Christ and feed upon him, his grace and benefits, and by faith convert them into nourishment to their souls. They are to take him as their Lord in life, yield themselves up to him, and live upon him. He is our life, Colossians 3 verse 4. 3. We have here an account of the ends of this institution. 1. It was appointed to be done in remembrance of Christ, to keep fresh in our minds an ancient favor, his dying for us, as well as to remember an absent friend, even Christ interceding for us, in virtue of his death, at God's right hand. The best of friends, and the greatest acts of kindness, are here to be remembered, with the exercise of suitable affections and graces. The motto on this ordinance, and the very meaning of it, is, when this you see, remember me. 2. It was to show forth Christ's death, to declare and publish it. It is not barely in remembrance of Christ, of what he has done and suffered, that this ordinance was instituted, but to commemorate, to celebrate, his glorious condescension and grace in our redemption. We declare his death to be our life, the spring of all our comforts and hopes. And we glory in such a declaration, we show forth his death, and spread it before God, as our accepted sacrifice and ransom. We set it in view of our own faith, for our own comfort and quickening, and we own before the world, by this very service, that we are the disciples of Christ, who trust in him alone for salvation and acceptance with God. For, it is moreover hinted here, concerning this ordinance. 1. That it should be frequent, as often as you eat this bread, etc. Our bodily meals return often, we cannot maintain life and health without this. 
and it is fit that this spiritual diet should be taken off in tool the ancient churches celebrated this ordinance every Lord's Day, if not every day when they assembled for worship. 2. That it must be perpetual. It is to be celebrated till the Lord shall come, till he shall come the second time, without sin, for the salvation of those that believe, and to judge the world. This is our warrant for keeping this feast. It was our Lord's will that we should thus celebrate the memorials of his death and passion, till he come in his own glory, and the Father's glory, with his holy angels, and put an end to the present state of things, and his own mediatorial administration, by passing the final sentence. Note, the Lord's Supper is not a temporary, but a standing and perpetual ordinance. 3. He lays before the Corinthians the danger of receiving unworthily, of prostituting this institution as they did, and using it to the purposes of feasting and faction, with intentions opposite to its design, or a temper of mind altogether unsuitable to it, or keeping up the covenant with sin and death, while they are there professedly renewing and confirming their covenant with God. 1. It is great guilt which such contract. They shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, verse 27, of violating this sacred institution, of despising his body and blood. They act as if they counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith they are sanctified, an unholy thing, Hebrews 10 verse 29. They profane the institution, and in a manner, crucify their Savior over again. Instead of being cleansed by his blood, they are guilty of his blood. 2. It is a great hazard which they run, they eat and drink judgment to themselves, verse 29. They provoke God, and are likely to bring down punishment on themselves. No doubt, but they incur great guilt, and so render themselves liable to damnation, to spiritual judgments and eternal misery. Every sin is in its own nature damning, and therefore surely so heinous a sin as profaning such a holy ordinance is so and it is profaned in the grossest sense by such irreverence and rudeness as the Corinthians were guilty of. But fearful believers should not be discouraged from attending at this holy ordinance by the sound of these words, as if they bound upon themselves the sentence of damnation by coming to the table of the Lord unprepared. Thus sin, as well as all others, leaves room for forgiveness upon repentance, and the Holy Spirit never indited this passage of Scripture to deter serious Christians from their duty, though the devil has often made this advantage of it, and robbed good Christians of their choicest comforts. The Corinthians came to the Lord's table as to a common feast, not discerning the Lord's body not making a difference or distinction between that and common food, but setting both on a level, nay, they used much more indecency at this sacred feast than they would have done at a civil one. This was very sinful in them, and very displeasing to God, and brought down His judgments on them, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Some were punished with sickness, and some with death. Note, a careless and irreverent receiving of the Lord's Supper may bring temporal punishments. Yet the connection seems to imply that even those who were thus punished were in a state of favor with God, at least many of them, they were chastened of the Lord, that they should not be condemned with the world, verse 32. Now divine chastening is a sign of divine love, whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, Hebrews 12 verse 6, especially with so merciful a purpose, to prevent their final condemnation. In the midst of judgment, God remembers mercy, he frequently punishes those whom he tenderly loves. It is kindness to use the rod to prevent the child's ruin. He will visit such iniquity as this under consideration with stripes, and yet make those stripes the evidence of his loving kindness. Those were in the favor of God who yet so highly offended him in this instance, and brought down judgments on themselves, at least many of them were, for they were punished by him out of fatherly goodwill, punished now that they might not perish forever. Note, it is better to bear trouble in this world than to be miserable to eternity. And God punishes his people now, to prevent their eternal woe. For, he points out the duty of those who would come to the Lord's table. 1. In general, let a man examine himself, verse 28, try and approve himself. Let him consider the sacred intention of this holy ordinance, its nature, and use, and compare his own views in attending on it and his disposition of mind for it, and, when he has approved himself to his own conscience in the sight of God, then let him attend. Such self-examination is necessary to a right attendance at this holy ordinance. Note, those who, through weakness of understanding, cannot try themselves, are by no means fit to eat of this bread and drink of this cup, nor those who, upon a fair trial, have just ground to charge themselves with impenitency, unbelief, and alienation from the life of God. Those should have the wedding garment on who would be welcome at this marriage feast grace in habit and grace in exercise. 
2. The duty of those who were yet unpunished for their profanation of this ordinance, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, verse 31. If we would thoroughly search and explore ourselves, and condemn and correct what we find amiss, we should prevent divine judgments. Note, to be exact and severe on ourselves and our own conduct is the most proper way in the world not to fall under the just severity of our Heavenly Father. We must not judge others, lest we be judged, Matthew 7 verse 1, but we must judge ourselves, to prevent our being judged and condemned by God. We may be critical as to ourselves, but should be very candid in judging others. 5. He closes all with a caution against the irregularities of which they were guilty, verse 33, 34, charging them to avoid all indecency at the Lord's table. They were to eat for hunger and pleasure only at home, and not to change the Holy Supper to a common feast, and much less eat up the provisions before those who could bring none did partake of them, lest they should come together for condemnation. Note, our holy duties, through our own abuse, may prove matter of condemnation. Christians may keep Sabbaths, hear sermons, attend at sacraments, and only aggravate guilt and bring on a heavier doom. A sad but serious truth. Oh! Let all look to it that they do not come together at any time to God's worship, and all the while provoke Him, and bring down vengeance on themselves. Holy things are to be used in a holy manner, or else they are profaned. What else was amiss in this matter, He tells them, He would rectify when He came to them.